Okay. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone, to the Cosine tutorial session. Uh, let's get started. Hello, everyone. My name is Meming. Uh, I'm the tutorial chair. I have been the, the tutorial chair since 2018, when uh, Alex Puget first uh, initiated this movement of having tutorials uh, for the co cosine community. Uh, and this, this will be my last year as a, as a chair. I've been on and off as a chair, but I, I'm retiring. <laughs> so this will be my last year. Um, yeah, so today we're going to have Tango Pereira. Uh, he's a PI at Salk. Uh, he did his PhD in Princeton. And today we're very privileged to have him uh, give his lecture, a, a very long tutorial, with a lot of preparation. I'm very excited to see what, what he has prepared for us uh, on sleep. So without further ado, uh, welcome, Tamo. Thank you, Meming, and thanks, everyone, for uh, coming out and letting us share a little bit about the work that we do with sleep uh, to enable automated behavioral quantification using deep learning. So uh, some logistical considerations first. So we have a, an exceedingly long session, um, and we really... Uh, uh, are proud of the fact that sleep is meant to be very easy to use, so I hope we don't take the full time. But uh, if you guys want to get started, what we're going to be doing first is um, a lecture. We're going to talk a bit about the history, background, and uh, outlook of this general field, and then we'll transition into just doing a full -time, the full-time tutorial. Um, if you want to start peeking ahead, you're, you're welcome to go to cosine.sleep.ai and uh, start checking out some of the setup steps. But um, as, as mentioned online, you will not need to download anything. It'll be pretty, pretty smooth and self-guided, but we'll be walking around afterwards. So to get started, um, let's jump into um, a little bit of background into uh, what led to sleep, why, why we built it, and what kind of stuff you can, you can kind of do with it. All right, so we're gonna start off. Oh, and I should mention, please feel free to interrupt. Like I said, we have lots and lots of time. We have lots of cool stuff to show you, but this is meant to be interactive and didactic. Okay, so we'll start with an observation, which is that life in all its forms evolved the ability to move, whether you're uh, a plant growing through soil, a fly grooming, uh, grooming its head, or a giraffe walking through a savanna. All of these forms of life evolved the ability to move because it was a very profound and fundamental evolutionary pressure that requires them to be able to move away from threats, move towards food, move to find mates, and then be able to pass on their genes. It was such an important core biological function that it ultimately led to the development of the nervous system and even the brain, really reflecting the, the primacy of this function. And so if you want to understand biology and, of course, the brain, as, as we are all want to in this, this conference, uh, it would behoove us to have a good way to quantify the types of biological movements that life evolved the ability to produce. But in other words, we'd like to be able to go from images and videos that look like this and distill them out into the core and essential elements of movement, the essential degrees of freedom that describe different kinds of behaviors and biological motions that might look a little bit like this. All right, so how are we gonna, about, gonna go about doing this? Well, uh, particularly in the context of, of behavior, we might call these types of movements uh, postural dynamics, and we can quantify them at a number of different levels. Starting at the coarsest level, we can do what's called centroid tracking. And this is what was done uh, classically for many, many years. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a few minutes. And this is a, 
a, a great way to describe overall movement of an animal within its space. It suffices to describe behaviors like navigation. But for other behaviors, like this fly grooming its head, what you might be able to tell is that it, uh, its centroid, its center of mass, is not moving at all. Therefore, we're not really capturing the degree of freedom that's really being uh, actuated by, by this animal's brain uh, during this particular behavior. And so to get at these degrees of freedom, we need to go down a further, a further level to what we call single animal pose estimation. And we'll get into the, the nuts and bolts of that in just a moment. And finally, at an even finer level, where you might want to characterize not just the, the biological movement of a single individual, we might want to actually track the movements of all the body parts of multiple interacting individuals, which introduces a number of additional challenges, both technical and conceptual, in terms of how we actually go about quantifying these types of movements. But this is super essential for the description of a whole major class of behaviors, one that's very uh, near and dear to the, you know, the, uh, the natural pressures that gave rise to the brain in the first place, social behaviors. So if we want to be able to understand all these things, we need to have the kinds of tools and technologies to quantify behavior across all these different levels. And so what my lab does is we uh, try to answer the question of how can we use technologies from the field of deep learning to quantify behavior across all these different levels. All right, so what we'll be talking about today is first a, uh, a primer, a little history on single animal pose estimation and uh, how these types of methods came to be at the, uh, just a few years ago. Then we'll talk about some of our more recent work, uh, namely in, in developing sleep for multi-animal pose tracking. And then finally, we'll end with a series of vignettes intended to give you a sense of the versatility, utility, and types of applications that these types of methods will enable, uh, have enabled and will continue to enable, including a little bit about what's coming, what's coming next. So, Let's go ahead and jump in and start looking at this uh, single animal pose estimation. All right, so as I mentioned, prior to the deep learning revolution of just a, couple, a few years ago, the state of the art and the main way that we'd go about analyzing behavior if you needed to automate it was essentially to do what's called you know, classical image processing. This is uh, a technique illustrated here uh, from the C-Trax paper, uh, paper from Kristen Branson, a huge landmark paper that really established some of the, the more, um, uh, more practical and more widely employed methods that were uh, widely in use across computer vision and image processing uh, and brought it over to the domain of, of animal behavior. And it, it was really a, a game changer at the time because it really pulled out all the stops to make this possible. And yet, it still, it still faced a number of different challenges, namely that it relied on doing what's called background subtraction, and it failed to capture limb kinematics. And the former is really one that, if you've ever, you know, uh, if you're old enough to have had to do any of this kind of classical tracking, you can very much appreciate where uh, there were many many PhD hours spent, mine included, in attempting to get your illumination perfectly consistent with a very clean background to ensure that it's really easy to separate your, your animal from its background, something that severely curtailed and constrained the types of experimental designs you could have if you wanted to be able to do automated behavior tracking. So, uh, and we'll, we'll get into the second part in just a moment. But this was still something that solved lots of problems, and even today, some of the, the techniques we use are, are very much based and would not be possible without some of this early work. So, animal pose estimation, right? This is the, the task of going from images like this, 
to detecting the locations and the coordinates of individual body parts of your animal that might look a little bit like this. We also call these landmarks, or as you'll see in the tutorial, nodes in the kind of graph theory parlance. But suffice it to say that these are essentially a set of experimenter-defined points of interest that generally are gonna fall along the morphology of the animal. And it's fully up to you what you call these. The algorithms don't really care what they're named. And you can kind of just choose and pick and choose whichever points that it is that you want to track. Here you can see that we're kind of labeling each point here with, its, uh, with a more human readable name. But for all intents and purposes, it doesn't really matter where you're putting these dots or what they're called or how many you have. So uh, before deep learning existed, this was still a need. At the end of the day, if you need to study anything in the realm of, of motor control, you care about uh, kinematics, or you're, you're studying biomechanics, it's still essential that you're able to detect these markers, uh, these landmarks, rather, uh, using some kind of method. And the classical method that was employed was essentially to put markers on, on our animals. And this is inspired by how people have done this for many years now in Hollywood through the use of, for example, motion capture suits that have retroreflective markers that are placed on an actor's, along an actor's body. The challenge is that uh, our typical lab animals, such as flies and rodents, are not huge fans of wearing motion capture suits. And it ends up being the case that you need pretty sophisticated experimental techniques that once again are gonna curtail and constrain the types of experimental designs that you can really have, such as this beautiful, awesome paper from Ben de Bivort's lab that came up with a very clever optical setup to be able to track individual legs of, the, of a fruit fly walking on a ball. Nonetheless, as you might imagine, this is not very scalable. It requires that you, you kind of uh, uh, fix your animal in place in a spherical treadmill and requires really specialized fluorescent dyes that the animals don't love getting applied, all sorts of other constraints, right? So once again, complex hardware and experimental setup and especially in this case, it can only, it's only really gonna work for a single animal. So how do we get around this and finally transition into the era where we can finally free ourselves of these shackles of having to create more contrived experimental setups? Well, uh, the year was, harken back with me, the year was 2015. Back in the old and dark days before we really had proper markerless pose estimation, and we were still asking all our animals and humans to wear uh, these contrived motion capture suits, uh, the deep learning revolution was in full gear. And around this time was when the first methods were first developed that demonstrated that you could use deep learning-based methods to uh, the task of markerless human pose estimation. And what you might appreciate in this little demo video here is that certainly some of the key points are a little bit jittery, it's, uh, there's some errors in there, but for the most part, this was pretty remarkable because you have a dancer without a motion capture suit being captured, not with a, a fancy point gray Fleur Bassler machine vision camera, but with a handheld camera that is you know, somewhat shaky. He's wearing a black shirt against a black background, which once again, nightmare for background subtraction, and not perfectly in the image plane, and there's all sorts of movements in and out, self-occlusions, basically all of the typical challenges that would essentially preclude the use of all these classical methods. And so in seeing this, it was very clear that this, is, this was definitely gonna be the, the way to go to enable this, this kind of approach. So how does this work? Well. Without getting into too much technical detail, although I'm happy to kind of get into that as we, as we move along, the, uh, there were two magic ingredients that allowed this to work. One was to define a big convolutional neural network, which if you're not super familiar with deep learning, don't worry about it. Just think of it as a, uh, a fancy function approximator that can take images as input, in this case, images of humans, and produces output, uh, a representation called uh, part confidence maps. This representation was really one of the key innovations that allowed deep learning based methods to outperform classical methods and really make this whole thing more robust. And it serves as the basis for all of the, the, the leading modern methods. 
the, the idea was to essentially, rather than having your machine learning algorithm predict the coordinates of the body parts directly from the image, it instead learns to predict this representation where we're encoding the probability of each body part being located in each part of the image as essentially just a pixel value that corresponds to that probability, where the closer you are to the ground truth location of the body part, the, the hotter or the higher the value of those pixels. And this was particularly important because it turned out that convolutional neural networks are A, really nice and efficient to train, but B, have really strong inductive biases that allow them to learn this kind of representation particularly well. And so the idea was that then you could train a neural network to predict these heat maps, which you could then use to inf uh, infer the pose by essentially finding the, the brightest pixel in each one of these uh, confidence maps, uh, essentially doing what's called peak detection. Okay, great. So, None of, none of the aspects of these mechanics are really specific to humans, right? So when we were looking at this early on, we were thinking, well, there's really no reason why we can't do this in, in animals, right? Why don't we just do that instead of building these crazy setups that, that add all these constraints? And I posed that exact question here at, uh, here at Cosine at a, at a workshop in, 20, uh, was in 2017, I think, uh, to some of the leading experts in the field. And the consensus was that it was going to be absolutely laughable that we'd be able to do this in animals. It was just never going to happen, likely in our lifetimes. And the reason for that was one that was very principled and that we didn't think was going to be tractable until we, we really tried to solve it. But essentially, the problem was that while all these, human, all these methods for human post estimation worked really well, they relied on the fact that there already existed these massive, massive labeled data sets with hundreds of thousands of labeled images with millions of individuals where, where at great expense to industry labs, they had already paid tons and tons of uh, crowdsourced workers to go through and click on the locations, the ground truth locations of all the body parts of all the people in all of these images, right? Resulting in this tremendous training set. In the, in the uh, common knowledge at the time, was that in order for deep learning methods to work, you really do need big data. Because essentially these models started working because you started making them bigger, you make them bigger, they have more parameters, therefore you need more data. It all kind of made sense, and so as long as you had a sufficiently large data set, especially one like this that requires ground truth labeling, then it, then it would probably work. The challenge obviously was that anytime we have a new animal, a new uh, body configuration, a new experimental setup, a new camera even, we have exactly zero labeled images because none of our lab images look anything like those that were in these uh, pre-existing human data sets. And so this was what was called the labeled data problem or uh, the, the general uh, property that we need to, to, to address here is what's called sample efficiency, which is to say, how efficient is your algorithm given the number of, of labeled examples that you provide to it. And so um, this was addressed um, in a couple different ways in those early days. Um, uh, one somewhat known method adopted a technique called uh, transfer learning, which was the, the standard in computer vision at the time, which is essentially to first pre-train a large uh, a neural network on a general image classification data set, namely something like ImageNet that really sparked the deep learning revolution. You then use that neural network to initialize the weights of the neural network, so you're essentially going to be reusing the same uh, neural network, except that you're going to chop off the output layers and replace them with the ones that will give you those confidence maps. Don't worry too much about the technical details, but suffice it to say that then the idea is that you can now, with relatively few labeled images, fine tune those weights because they're already starting off at a point where they're relatively close to the ideal solution because it, was, it had been observed that if you train your know, networks on large enough computer vision data sets, they're going to learn a bunch of image feature detectors that already know, uh, regardless of the task, how to detect things like edges and rounded patterns and uh, uh, textures and so forth. 
And so if you already know how to recognize a bunch of uh, scenes and properties and features of the natural world, then maybe you don't need as much data to just fine tune it, to just tweak it, to reuse those features to solve the, the given task. And this was the core approach used in methods like, uh, like deep lab cuts and others. Um, in parallel, um, before uh, that, that method was released, we were also thinking about this problem and we decided to tackle it in a slightly different way, which was to achieve high sample efficiency through archi neural network architecture design, where I mentioned that in the case of uh, human pose estimation, all these models use really large convolutional neural networks, as was thought to be necessary at the time to achieve a high performance. What we did instead is we developed a method called LEAP. LEAP stands for LEAP Estimate to Animal Pose. It's a, it's a cute recursive acronym, courtesy of Diego Durando, who was my uh, undergraduate mentee at the time. And the way that LEAP worked was pretty similar to those human pose estimation methods. It took a raw image of our animals as input, fed that in through a convolutional neural network, which then learned to predict a set of part confidence maps that we could use to infer the, the poses or those landmark locations. Our key uh, innovation and insight, however, was that if we design a lightweight enough convolutional neural network, one that has the same types of inputs and outputs, but requires many fewer parameters to achieve the same transformation, that perhaps it would require fewer labeled data as well, right? We're kind of scaling down the model to the size of the data rather than scaling up the model and requiring larger scale data. And so when we tried that out, we found that this was indeed the case, where with as few as 10 labeled images, we're getting to pretty reasonable accuracy, uh, where here the outer circles correspond to where 90% of the predictions fall relative to the ground truth. So you can see that you know, for some body parts, it was doing pretty good. For some, body, for some harder body parts, not so much. But by the time that we got to around 250 labeled images, we were getting to pretty much perfect accuracy, almost as good as, as, as how, how well two humans would label the same thing. Um, and again, this is with uh, hundreds of labeled images, not hundreds of thousands, effectively achieving you know, several orders of magnitude worth of uh, of improved efficiency compared to those human pose estimation methods. But a byproduct of this approach was that because the neural networks were small, they were also really fast. They were fast to train. And what that meant was that even with, on a single desktop GPU, that is to say we didn't need tons of GPUs, GPU servers, GPU data centers or clusters, but rather on a single conventional kind of gaming desktop GPU, we were able to train these models on uh, with a, as few as a, uh, in as little as a few minutes, and the you know the the speed advantages didn't end there. It also allowed us to do inference or prediction very quickly, which then enabled what is uh, is known as the human in the loop training or labeling workflow. This is sometimes referred to as active learning, although there's some small technical distinctions. But the idea is that if you just if you can train very quickly predict very quickly, that means that within a reasonable amount of time, you can train your neural network, have it predict on the frames that you haven't labeled yet, and then only have to correct the mistakes that the network makes rather than having to label everything from scratch. And what we found was that this general approach drastically reduced the amount of time that it took to generate new images, where even though our model would work very well with very few images, it always does better the more images you give it, and by adopting this approach, which is enabled by having a lightweight network architecture, you can do all this in the afternoon and kind of get yourself to the point where you can now only spend a few seconds to label every frame, increasing the data set, and getting to optimal performance much, much more quickly than you could otherwise. And despite the fact that these were small models that are really kind of designed to, to work well with a, a small, a, a constrained domain of images, it still was, was able to work pretty well across all sorts of different image conditions and animals and, uh, and experimental settings. And so at this point I should say that, you know, this is all work that I did early in my PhD. Things have progressed a lot since then. And I, I wanna highlight a couple different more recent methods that 
have tackled the same problem of sample efficiency in what I think are particularly clever ways. And so uh, one general class of approaches here to solve this labeled data problem or sample efficiency problem is just to, to bake in more priors into your model. We know a lot of things about animal pose data. We know that things tend to be self-similar and autocorrelated across frames. And this is something that methods like lightning pose uh, from Liam Paninsky's lab uh, takes advantage of, where you can use techniques like semi-supervised uh, learning and uh, take advantage of these uh, kinds of constraints of things like temporal smoothness to ensure that you can actually achieve higher performance with less data. These kinds of algorithmic tricks have really been uh, pretty essential to the uh, evolution of computer vision in recent years and are particularly applicable in this domain. But there have also been quite a few other, other methods from other folks uh, uh, like, like Tim Dunn that have, uh, Anchi Wu, that have essentially adopted similar kinds of algorithmic tricks to ensure that you're getting the most bang for your buck out of data that you're labeling or even data that you haven't labeled. Um, similarly, another way to uh, solve this labeled data problem is to simply automate collection of new data. And so in a recently uh, published approach from Ayman Azim's lab, uh, uh, my colleague at the Salk, uh, called, uh, in a method called GlowTrack, the idea is to kind of combine the best of, of all worlds, where if you'll recall the classic method of putting fluorescent dyes on flies and putting them on treadmill, the idea here is to leverage that kind of approach to bootstrap training data set generation, where here the, the clever idea was to create this little party dome for, <laughs> for the mice that essentially would flash different colors of light that would activate different, uh, um, uh, I suppose, uh, dyes that, that are activated by different wavelengths of light and essentially alternate that with just capturing images in regular IR. And so if you alternate between activating your dyes and not activating them quickly enough, you'll get pairs of frames that are similar enough that essentially you can leverage the markers from one frame to automatically label the subsequent frame that doesn't have those markers. And what you end up with is a data set that you can use to train your pose estimation model um, without having to do any actual uh, manual labeling. And so these kinds of techniques can work really well in settings where you can, you can devise setups that, that work like this. Again, demonstrating the, the advantage and benefit to kind of look back and see how people solve the similar problems prior to particular technologies being developed. You can always reuse these tricks, and it's something that, that we certainly have done in our work uh, uh, all throughout. All right. I'm going to pause there for just a second. Just, does anyone have any questions on this initial section before we move on to multi-animal pose estimation? Yes? <laughs> yeah. Are there strange animals that the present challenges here? 100%, yeah, I think uh, cephalopods in general have always presented a challenge, but this is one where we, we've, we've tackled this to some extent, and some other folks have as well. Um, the core idea there is that you, know, you have morphological structures that are, are not very well constrained by a, a skeleton. So, the idea of putting landmarks along the joints, for example, is, is, doesn't quite work out. But there is, once again, where we can borrow from and learn from how people solve this problem in other fields. And the, the predominant field that has tackled the problem of like how do we track things that are kind of wavy and non-rigid is the field of C. elegans, where for a long time now, folks have developed methods to be able to track uh, worms in, in uh, you know, semi-liquid uh, semi media and still are able to solve this problem. And so the idea is that you're essentially just going to intersperse a set of landmarks all along the curvature, and this method can work just as well with deep learning as well as non-deep learning-based methods. And towards the end, when we get to the applications, I'll show a, a, a little vignette of some of the recent work that we have done on similar kind of curvy nonlinear structures. Again, feel free to interrupt if there's any questions. 
Oh, yep. Hey. So what does it do for the, that we're talking about in the class? Is there a support model or Yeah, that's a good question. So certainly one of the, the you know, uh, kind of magic features here, both in the both in Leap and the approach that we came up with, as well as in some of these more recent methods, is to always just bake in more inductive biases. More the more aspects that you have in the network that get you close, there's more they're more amenable to learning the types of transformations that you need to do in order to solve this core problem. The less data that you're going to need. And so in our case, the, the thing that was essential was to use a fully convolutional neural network, one that, once again, has these really strong um, uh, local spatial biases due to this property of spatial equivariance, which is to say, if you learn how to detect a nose way up here in the image, that nose should look the same if, you're, if, you're, if it's way down here in the image. And so by being able to reuse that filter, regardless of where in the image it might be located, you're buying yourself a lot more parameters because you don't need to learn a new, a new function for a nose that's on the top left of the image and a nose that's on the bottom right of the image. That was one, one magic trick. There are plenty of others, and I think that at the end of the day, um, not enough is known, I think, about neural networks at that really small scale. A lot of the scaling laws and theory that have, has been developed in, uh, since then has really demonstrated that definitely these networks scale very well with data, they're, they're, they're really strongly correlated with, with each other, the size of the data, the size of the models. But what happens in that really small regime is still kind of a, a little bit of, of, a, of a mystery. But we certainly, one thing that, that holds true at all scales is the more priors you have, the less, less data you need. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I wouldn't say quite a library. There are a couple of emerging approaches that have been working on doing precisely that. Um, we're, we're working on this generalization problem as well. We hope that in the next, uh, hopefully, six to 12 months, we'll, we'll have something that'll just be built right into sleep that should just work well for these more common settings. But there are challenges with doing that, because effectively what you're doing is now creating what are called foundation models. And while it's easy enough to collect large data sets, especially now that we've made these tools really accessible, and just essentially try to train a very generalist model, it always comes with trade-offs. And given the fact that this is, these are scientific applications, we want to be very careful to ensure that the models that we're training are uh, fair in the you know, findable, accessible, uh, interoperable and reusable sense, reproducible, and that we're not introducing uh, structural biases by virtue of the way that we trained or the data that we collected that might impact downstream science. So to give you a concrete example, while we actually have some, some networks, even some trained by folks in this room, that actually generalize remarkably well to entirely new setups, um, what we don't want to do is just to put it out there and have people start using this thing without really you know, kind of putting in some safeguards and ensuring that nothing, nothing funky can happen. And I think that we see this a lot these days with large language models, which are, in a similar sense, pre-trained on a lot of stuff, and they can produce a lot of garbage. We, the, what we would hate to do is to have a lot of people use a model that says that the kinematics of some paw movement or, or nose movement um, are are failing to capture some underlying biological signal just by virtue of the fact that it wasn't, well, those kinds of movements or poses were not well represented in our data set, right? The worst thing to do would be to have actually start creating bogus science when it's such a fundamental tool. But we're working on it and we want to kind of do it right. Um, that said, there are some emerging approaches in computer vision, including uh, uh, a super animal from the, from the Mathis labs that, um, adopt some of these approaches. Cool. So I'm going to go ahead and start moving on here for the, in the interest of time and get into multi-animal. So it wasn't too hard at the end of the day to really adopt these methods to work well in the single animal setting. But when we moved to the domain of multi-animal, initially we thought this is going to be easy, right? Do with one, 
how hard is it to do with, with two, right? Turns out there are pretty unique challenges in this, in this domain, the second that you get to, to have more than one animal, because while it was trivial enough to just extend our method to, rather than having the neural network predict heat maps with a single peak, instead predicting heat maps with multiple peaks so that it corresponds to multiple noses and multiple heads and multiple tails, it's a much harder problem to figure out which head goes with which tail, right? At this point, we're not just reasoning about, we're not asking our neural network to just reason about what does a nose or a tail look like, we're asking it to reason about what is a body? What constitutes an individual? And that requires reasoning at a much higher scale and a much higher level of abstraction. Because now we're not just thinking like, what is a head and what is a tail, but rather what, what makes a head and a tail related to each other in the sense that what we would call belonging to the same animal. And that's particularly challenging in the domain of multi-animal where we're studying typically social behaviors because this is exactly where we have animals that are gonna be very closely interacting. And when they're closely interacting, you have a lot of occlusions, you have a lot of body parts that are, look very similar, being very close to by in, uh, next to each other. So this is the problem they call part grouping. And the second problem is uh, an arguably even more challenging one, which is what we call identity assignment, which is to say, assuming that we have detected all the body parts and grouped them appropriately so that they belong to the same animal within a frame, how do we ensure that it's the same animal across subsequent frames, right? This is also called multi-object tracking, and it requires now not just reasoning about what is a body part or what is a body, but really what is an identity? What makes an animal an animal, right? What, 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 if, you, if you look at two images and, and you, know, you, can, you wanna be able to ask the question for given two detections, are these the same? It now really requires you to either have a really, really strong understanding of how animals move so you can predict between, between consecutive frames, the likelihood that each animal connected to, uh, is connected to each other based on a, a model of their movement, which if we had that, we probably wouldn't need to do any of this because the perfect model of animal movement is the brain. If we, had a, if we could perfectly predict how animals are gonna move in the next time step, we probably wouldn't need to do a lot of neuroscience in the first place. So it ends up being a bit of a tricky engineering challenge. And what we ended up finding in trying out a whole bunch of different methods was that no single method works well across all the different data sets that represent the diversity of data that you see in, in typical lab settings. And so this motivated the development of sleep, or social leap, as today's animal poses, a now cute double recursive acronym, that ended up being the successor of, of leap. And sleep is intended to be an end-to-end -end framework that takes you from raw videos through to annotation, training the networks, applying them, and then, use, and then visualizing and correcting your data, right? But in other words, Marshall's the power of deep learning to get you from raw images to attract uh, uh, body parts with, on any number of animals, on any body configuration, any experimental setting, and so on and so forth. And when we were developing it, we really tried it out against a whole bunch of different data sets to really ensure this thing would generalize and work across all the domains that we could, we could point it at. And it definitely ended up being the case that you know, it, it, it works across all sorts of different species, experimental conditions, importantly, even imaging conditions, as we'll see later, and how it performs with particularly noisy data. And this was really all enabled by uh, a really strong emphasis on uh, industry-grade software engineering, in particular for ensuring accessibility, as we'll see momentarily. Um, the idea was to design a, uh, a system that is modular, uh, allows us to develop and implement new algorithms without breaking the rest of the code, ensuring that it's really stable, really uh, able to uh, withstand real world conditions that you know, will, will come up as you have different kinds of systems and, and platforms and, and data and so forth. Um, and we think that this emphasis on, on accessibility, making it really, really easy to use, um, has really uh, uh, you know, uh, proven successful, where pretty much since I started my lab and I needed to begin to apply for grant funding and realized that we should probably have been tracking metrics of how many people are using sleep, since that point, we uh, have seen pretty 
monotonically increasing user adoption, where now we're up to like several dozen uh, new users that, that adopt Sleep per day, which has been pretty, pretty overwhelming. And recently, we you know, hit just over 100,000 downloads across over 9,000 unique users in countries all over the world. And these users have gotten together and really created a bit of a community through our, our, our GitHub in the form of many, many, many issues that have been posted, both bugs and, and suggestions that I assure you we go through all of them. We just don't have the time to necessarily address all of them as, as adequately as we would like. Um, hundreds and hundreds of, of discussions, an infinity of emails, which is to say, I strongly encourage you to post in our, in our GitHub first. We have a whole team of folks, some, some of whom are here, who will diligently uh, uh, keep track of those, of those posts and make sure that they're answered at some point, whereas my inbox is now an endless uh, pit of doom, which may not get responses very quickly, if at all. But um, we're very committed to ensuring that we can support our, our user base, and we have continued to do so. But Again, this is all bolstered by our philosophy that if we engineer the software well, ideally, you shouldn't need to ask a question in the first place. If someone's asking a question, we are, we are going to always assume that there's 10 other people who didn't bother to ask the question, so we should just improve the software itself. And I think this is in contrast to how a lot of people view scientific software, that it's just something that, well, we just need higher quantitative literacy. People just need to learn how to code. Yes, fine, sure, they should, but I'm not sure you know, how much more neuroscience gets done when everyone needs to learn how to troubleshoot how to install their GPU drivers in CUDA and TensorFlow. Some people here seem to have <laughs> installed CUDA and TensorFlow before. Yes, it's a, it's a pain. and something that we know how to do well, so why don't we just do it for everyone else, right? There's enough things to learn in neuroscience. I was in a, I was in a fly lab. I had to learn fly brain surgery. I appreciate that neuroscience requires broad skill sets, and that if we all do our part, especially as tool developers, I think the whole field can move forward uh, a little bit more quickly. Okay, so as I said, and as you'll uh, experience, you know, we put a lot of work into all aspects of the sleep system. And we're gonna highlight a few of these different pieces here, which all have different unique stories, but one that is most user-facing and that you all experience if you're not already through the tutorial, it really is this first part of how you pull in the data, how you label it, and how you interact with the system in the first place. And so here, we're gonna have a 90-second version of the slightly longer tutorial that you're gonna be doing uh, in, in a few minutes, where you can see that sleep is really intended to be very intuitive, very uh, drag and drop. There's no coding required. You can drop your video in there. You're gonna generate a list of frames to label, so you can kind of keep track of your progress. Um, everything is, is, is point and click. You just drag and position the body parts where they should go. We have all sorts of little hotkeys and, and utilities to make that process faster and easier. And importantly, it really plays on the, this whole aspect of being able to have high sample efficiency, which is to say that it can work really, really well with very little data, as we'll, we'll observe empirically a little bit later. We'll be able, you're able to see the progress of neural network training in real time, something which in our experience is not just a nice to have, but something that helps to build really strong intuitions about what's working well with your data and your model, so that's not just a black box. It then automates all sorts of little, little functions that are just nice quality of life enhancements, things like generating predictions right after you train so that it automates that whole process of doing human in the loop, um, applying the model again to new data, super straightforward and super configurable, and so forth. Again, I won't belabor that. We're gonna, we're gonna be doing a lot of that later. Okay. Um, in this next part, what I wanna do is I wanna highlight a couple of different pieces here which go towards addressing those two problems we talked about of the multi-animal setting, right? That of part grouping and identity assignment. So starting with part grouping, there's two predominant paradigms for, for solving this problem in the computer vision field. One is what's called uh, top-down, which is an approach in which we first find all of the animals and then detect their body parts, right? And the way that this is structured in sleep is one where is, is uh, such that we take an image 
the, the whole image of our frame, feed that into a neural network that learns to detect an anchor body part. Think of this as the centroid. So once again, we're kind of, kind of reaching back to, to the uh, uh, annals of animal behavior quantification history and really learning about what worked. And it turns out the centroid tracking problem is one that's, that's uh, particularly easy when you're using these neural networks. And so that serves as like a sort of first stage of this approach. We use that to then crop a bounding box around each one of our animals and feed that into a second stage neural network that learns to predict the pose of each one of the animals, even if there is another animal present uh, somewhere in that crop. And the idea here is that this type of model is learning to solve the part grouping problem implicitly, right? By having a centered crop, it's learning that only the body parts that are related to the thing that's right there at the center, right there in the middle, should be the ones that are detected. And it's gonna learn to ignore all those body parts that might be present in the, in the periphery of the image. So it's gonna be sensitive to how well you can center the animal within this crop. But it works remarkably well and it's quite fast because it saves you on a lot of processing time because detecting the centroids is really fast and easy. You can do it at low resolution. Detecting the body parts is expensive, but if you're only doing it on a small subset of the image, it, the whole thing ends up being super fast. Now that said, an alternative approach is what's called bottom-up, in which we first detect all the body parts and then we group them into animals. And this works in a slightly different way, where we first take a, an, the, the whole image, feed it into a neural network that uh, learns to predict two representations. One is that required for localization, essentially those confidence maps, except that we're gonna detect all the body parts of all the animals, which don't know who, which one belongs to who. And then we'll, we'll, we'll learn another representation of the connectivity between those body parts. This is, this is what's called the part affinity fields, and it was also originally developed in the human pose estimation field. We adopted it slightly, but it works, the, the general theory works in the same way. The idea is that we're learning to predict a set of arrows all along the body that point along the direction towards the body part that it should be connected, that each body part should be connected to. What we can then do is we can take these, these vector fields, take line integrals across them, and use that to generate these scores, essentially for every pair of body parts that could theoretically be connected to each other, we can score that connection based on the alignment with this connectivity representation. And then we do some fancy uh, graph theory, algorithmic, okay, part type graph matching, suffice to say like a, uh, an algorithm that can parse out based on those scores, which body parts would ultimately be connected to each other under some constraints and assumptions that allow you to ensure optimality. Essentially, it's, we just have to assume that the body part, the body is structured like a, like a tree from graph theory. But under those assumptions, this works remarkably well. And what we find empirically is that in this explicit approach, as compared to the implicit approach of, of connecting the body parts, they're gonna work better and worse in different settings. In particular, in some settings, like in, in rodents, we can we will often see a little bit of an improvement when we in accuracy when we use the uh, these uh, uh, part affinity fields, the bottom up approach, particularly in cases where you have noisier data, where it benefits from requiring your model to learn this sort of higher level structure of connectivity. By doing so, it has to reason about the body in a way that can sometimes overcome having worse quality images. The trade offs. Uh, don't stop there. We also find, this is something predicted directly from the theory, that whereas with the bottom-up approach, because it's a single stage neural network that we run once, no matter how many animals, the performance, the speed, is gonna be about the same regardless of how many animals you have, because that whole post-processing step is done almost instantaneously. Whereas in a top-down approach, while it's, it's very fast when you have very few animals, it scales almost linearly with the number of animals. This is because for that second stage neural network that's processing the crops, it needs to essentially do one forward pass. It needs to, to, to process each one of those crops. So the more animals you have, the more crops, the more time that it takes. And because most of the computing power is in that second stage, that almost entirely dictates the performance of the entire model. So you're, you're 
you know, your performance is really going to vary under, under different settings. And what we provide in sleep is an ability to very easily switch between these and compare across them. So you can always just tune to the one that was going to work best for your model. Cool. So that's part grouping. And we find that in general, between those two approaches, we tend to have pretty solid solutions for most cases. Now, how about identity assignment? Once again, we find that there isn't a single solution that, that uh, works for everything. So we devise two different approaches. One is what's what we call temporal association. Uh, it's an algorithm called flow shift that essentially is uh, what's also known as, as multi-object tracking, in which the idea is that we apply optical flow, uh, a classic technique from computer vision, to predict where the body parts in one image are going to land in the second image. That's what is represented by these little ghosts here. And the idea is that if we can predict where the animals are going to be in the future, then we can use that to associate past animals with future detections. right? And this, this is essentially a very cheap, very easy to use motion model that will work really well a lot of the times and does not require any labeling or training simply because it is something that is, is done in, uh, in closed form, is to say there's an, just an algorithm that you can just apply to your images to compute the, the, the change in the image pixels, and we can convert that into uh, estimates of where parts of the image are moving. And we apply that to each body part, take the aggregate, which altogether gives us an estimate of where the animal is going to be next. This actually ends up working quite, quite well in a lot of cases. We get to relatively few errors with a couple of other tricks, but it still does give you some errors. And the issue is that if you make an error in one frame, it's going to propagate to the rest of time. That is to say, if I switch you know, my control and my experimental animal on frame 1,000, it's going to be wrong in frame 1,001 through to the rest of the video. And that means that it, it creates these sort of catastrophic errors which is just simply not acceptable in a lot of lots of different use cases. So to address that, we developed a different approach called uh, identification via direct classification, in which the idea is that we are explicitly not considering time at all, but rather we're going to rely on the idea that animals might have slightly distinguishing visual markers, uh, visual appearances. And this is inspired by approaches like ID tracker, and the idea is that here, sleep will learn, but uh, it relies on you first identifying each animal as belonging to a different identity class. And we're essentially just classifying each animal as to belonging to each one of these classes, such as male or female, uh, young or old, and so forth. You also apply artificial markers to them to, to basically bias this kind of detection, if that's at all feasible. And the advantage is that it does not rely on time at all. So it cannot, by design, propagate errors. And to illustrate exactly what, what we mean by this, here we see that a very common case in which we make these errors in identity tracking is where we also have errors in the pose estimation in the first place. And if that happens in one frame, it will then propagate to subsequent frames, meaning it'll continue to be wrong Whereas with our appearance-based methods, it cannot propagate these errors. Therefore, it'll self-correct over time. And we apply this to some, uh, uh, some use cases, such as um, when we have long-term continuous recordings, such as in this durable data set from Dan Sain's lab at NYU that was recorded for uh, multiple weeks at a time. And when you have that much data, it's just intractable to really go in and manually correct or try to find when switches might have happened. We have this many animals and this many, this many frames. But what you can see here is that, particularly in this case where you have these gerbils, which are arguably the, the cuddliest of rodents, they really like to make these cuddle puddles, or I'm sure there's a more technical term for it. But you know, whilst adorable, it is a nightmare for, for tracking because they are completely occluding each other. They become this big, indistinguishable blob of, of fur. So um, what uh, Sleep is able to do is to track their poses the best that it can, given the limited information that it has when the animals are on top of each other. But as soon as the huddle resolves, they, uh, the identities also resolve. 
So once the animals are no longer including each other, we, we're reliably identifying them once again, right? Effectively solving this problem in a, in a more practical sense. Cool. So um, I'll, I want to highlight one more little story here, and then we'll switch over to the, some of the vignettes. Uh, but I'm happy to talk about any of the other aspects here, such as some of the innovations that we developed for uh, designing other, other backbone architectures and how they compare to alternative methods like transfer learning. But we'll, we'll, we can come back to that if, if folks are curious. So highlighting the little end bit there that pertains to how we implement the inference part. Like I said, we put a lot of work into ensuring that this is a really mature software package. We're using all of the best and, and latest uh, best practices and latest uh, state-of-the-art techniques for implementing the way that we do uh, everything from training all the way through to, to inference. And the main parameter they really care about when you're when you're talking about inference is is the speed. How fast can I process how many images? And this kind of breaks down into two different uh, uh, settings. One is offline tracking, which is to say I just want to process as much data as possible. I have tons and tons of videos. Um, I can leave it running overnight, but if it's going to take a whole week versus you know, one day, it starts to make a difference in terms of practicality. And what we found was that by adopting things like um, autograph and, and doing GPU kernel compilation and all sorts of other fancy tricks, you know, we would get to pretty fast speeds, up to hundreds of frames per second, much faster than real time, uh, when we used a batch size of 16, which is to say we're paralyzing over at least 16 images. But the more important setting is one that enables new, new functionality, which is real-time tracking, where our goal is not to just process as many images as we can per second, but rather to minimize the latency. In other words, how long does it take for you to predict a new image uh, after you get it out from the camera? And in this setting, we are getting down to just a few, um, uh, as little as a few milliseconds, something like 12 milliseconds, using the same model that we use for offline tracking. That is to say, we use full resolution images and without sacrificing accuracy at all, we were still able to get something around 12 milliseconds of latency on a pretty high resolution image where we're essentially in, in, these, in these 12 milliseconds tracking 26 body, detecting 26 body parts, grouping them and identifying uh, which animals which. Therefore making it really you know, pretty close to compatible with real time. Uh, but after we connected with some folks from NVIDIA, we uh, uh, began experimenting with a technology called TensorRT, which drastically speeds up performance in both settings, roughly by, by threefold uh, in either case, by essentially optimizing how the, these neural networks run on the GPU. And what that enabled was a, you know, kind of a proof of principle application here that we call social mind control, which is to say, here we have an experimental setup in which we have a female fruit fly and a male fruit fly engaged in their, in their courtship ritual, where by experimental design, the female would be sexually receptive to the male's approaches. But because we can detect that in real time, what we can do is uh, we can optogenetically activate a set of neurons in the female fly brain that causes her to artificially reject him. So put in other words, we're detecting the social behavior of one animal, and we're using that to, in real time, control the social behavior response of another animal, therefore allowing us to kind of break the, break the whole closed loop of sensory motor transformations that occur in fast time scale social behaviors, therefore enabling all sorts of new experimental paradigms where you might imagine you know, asking questions like, what would happen if a particular neuron or, or a set of neurons were active or inactive during a particular behavioral event in, in, the standard, in a standard natural behavior uh, sequence. Um, and while this is powerful, TensorRT is a little bit hairy to use. So uh, we, did, we partnered with folks from uh, 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 a software called Bonsai. Uh, Bonsai is a visual programming language, uh, which is developed by Gonzalo Lopez, that um, allows you to create experimental workflows just by dragging and dropping these different nodes that control everything from ac acquiring images from a camera, doing all sorts of processing on it, saving it out, and now also being able to drop in a node that allows you to run a sleep model in real time as part of your experimental workflow, uh, which then you can use in this, in this setting to design 
closed loop stimulation, for example. Cool. So that's uh, yeah, that's about it's about the end of our, our stories here on multi-animal pose tracking. And what I want to end with is some a set of vignettes on some of the work that my lab has been doing, as well as some other folks have been doing in applying these technologies to enable new kinds of uh, 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 scientific applications and directions, as well as having a little bit of an outlook of where these technologies are going to go, as well as what does this mean for, for, for science, neuroscience, computational neuroscience, and beyond. And we can probably take questions right after and hopefully transition into the, to the break. Cool. So one natural application of this is, not, is, of course, just to scale it way up, right? Spent all this, all this time making, uh, making, making sleep faster, so let's just now do it at really large scale. So in collaboration with lots of folks uh, at, at the Salk Institute, also a place to set up these kinds of collaborations, we've been developing a system for automated animal phenotyping in a home cage-like setting. And so the idea is that we're, we, we've built these setups that are optimized for 24-7 uh, recording of, animal, of, of mice in their home cage that uh, essentially are, have as, as ideal conditions as possible for machine vision applications so that we can fully automate behavior tracking and phenotype extraction. And so that means that we can collect videos that, that look like this. Um, this is our older generation, where we've drastically improved the, the imaging conditions, but this is still good enough to get us started. Uh, we were using these mini cams, courtesy of Deanna Haroni at UCLA. And the idea was to be able to track many, many mice across these, uh, these cages. We're now in the process of scaling them up to several hundred of these, uh, where the idea is that we can extract from the pose all sorts of different quantitative phenotypes that then can be reused for a variety of different questions including to tackle the uh, diagnosis and detection of different uh, disease models, ranging from amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Alzheimer's, and even, even uh, non-neural diseases like, like pancreatic cancer that nonetheless still affect uh, the animal's behavior. So what we end up with is you know, essentially trajectories that look like this, right? We end up getting hundreds and hundreds of hours of uh, of pose tracking, of movements of every body part of, of the animal in their cage over really long periods of time. So we've got to now figure out a way to make sense of it. And one way to do that is to do the really basic uh, kinds of level of uh, descriptive analyses, uh, which you've ever used software like Animes or, or other kinds of things. It's essentially just, for example, detecting when different body parts are overlapping with each other, with different objects in the environment, allowing us to distill out all, all these poses, <clears throat> all these pose coordinates into a uh, time series like you see on the left that correspond to more uh, semantically meaningful signals like whether the animals are feeding or whether they're jumping on top of, their, of this uh, uh, food cage or around the lid of the, of, the, of the cage, or sorry, the rims of the cage that all correspond to more kinds of uh, motor, locomotor activity. But there's a lot more that we can pull out of this. And the challenge is that if we try to visualize here a very small subset of our, one of our pilot data sets, it's a tremendous amount of data. But as you can see, there's all sorts of patterning here. You can tell, you can tell that by all that little striping and all the little bands and all the little blocks and switching and so forth that correspond to surely interesting dynamics that are occurring in terms of the animal's movements. So how can we make sense of this, of this really rich, high dimensional and very voluminous data? Well, um, in collaboration with some of our friends at, at Harvard and Stanford, we have been uh, applying a, an algorithm called Keypoint MoSeq from Bob Data's lab and, and Scott Linderman's um, that works natively and, and quite well with sleep to essentially distill out from large amounts of pose tracking of these continuous trajectories uh, what are called behavioral syllables, essentially discrete clusters or discrete structure that describes uh, times in which you're, you're observing the same or very similar kinds of movement dynamics. And this is done by fitting a probabilistic model that tries to generate the trajectories given uh, a condition that it is in a discrete state. And it can then, in an unsupervised fashion, 
discover this kind of discrete structure directly from the data by just attempting to reproduce it. And we apply this to some of our pilot data of that where we're capturing the phenoconversion, essentially the transition into the um, overt disease state of ALS. ALS is a, uh, a motor neuron disease that leads to progressive loss of motor function and eventually death. And so the idea was that, well, let's just do it for a very first pass analysis. Let's look at the histogram, the change in how much each syllable is used late into the disease, where we know that there are, there's motor dysfunction happening, versus early in the disease, where the animals appear somewhat normal. And if we look at all the syllables, I mean, they're, they're, they all just have numbers, and we can you know, try to inspect them, but the idea here is that by doing this kind of differential analysis, what we can discover are the syllables that occur more in late uh, ALS versus the ones that occur less, thereby serving as a sort of behavioral biomarker. But we can look at these guys individually to kind of sanity check that it's pulling out structure that's, that's meaningful. And for example, one of these syllables that tend to occur a lot less late into the disease is this climbing-like signature, uh, this uh, syllable. And this is totally something that we'd expect to happen in a motor neuron disease where the animals progressively lose their ability to coordinate their, their body. They're not gonna be able to do this kind of climbing anymore. Similarly, we can look at all sorts of examples from ones that, that happen less uh, late into disease versus ones that even happen more, such as this sort of uh, hunching slash idle and self-grooming behaviors that tend to be natural responses to, to pain and distress that are gonna happen as you, as you progress into the disease. So, this is all just preliminary data that are sort of a, a sanity check that this, this general pipeline uh, can work. And what we're doing now is scaling this way up, adding lots more animals, months and months of data, and uh, uh, trying to build out the entire behavioral repertoire that describes a progression before phenoconversion, or at least what is clinically known as phenoconversion, into the more overt parts of the disease with the ultimate objective of being able to detect very slight movement patterns that can predict the eventual occurrence of the disease before it gets too overt. And this is something that just would not have been possible without these kinds of tools that allow us to automatically look for patterns that perhaps for a, a, a human observer, even a clinician, might be somewhat idiosyncratic. It might be that at the end of the day, it's just that you're doing something a little bit less, maybe even 10% less or 5% less, and not that you have, say, a full-on tremor or, or inability to uh, perform an activity of daily living. And so uh, we'll, we'll be doing a lot more work and in, in, in talking more ab about this in the coming uh, months and years, but we're super excited that this general approach can work for this setting. And I wanted to highlight uh, a recently published uh, uh, preprint from my colleague Ishmael Abdusabur at Columbia, who also has collaborated with, uh, uh, with Bob to apply sleep to an entirely new model system for neuroscience, that of the, the naked mole rat. And what they've been doing in this, in this early work is applying sleep to do the pose tracking in an entirely different species that we certainly had never you know, previously looked at, uh, throwing that into key point MoSeq and characterizing the behavioral repertoire that distinguishes different classes of, of uh, members of, of these naked mole rat colonies, namely the, the queen versus the workers, giving some insight into how uh, the uh, epigenetic and other changes that occur as they take on those roles uh, get manifested into, in terms of their behavioral repertoire. And finally, I just wanna mention that one of the other, I mean, if that's out there, one that we're particularly excited about is to now apply this to, to look at behavior in space. Uh, where we're, we recently received a, a grant from NASA to essentially characterize the phenotypes of mice in the International Space Station to study the effects of long-term space travel, exposure to radiation, and exposure to low gravity. Uh, once again, kind of attempting to just try to, to highlight the versatility and generalizability of this approach to different kinds of settings. And we're super excited about this. It's gonna be a very difficult data set to track, but we'll. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll try. <laughs> um, but ultimately, this is uh, to enable 
uh, technology to be able to do this kind of motion capture and, and video-based phenotyping, even for uh, uh, astronauts, for, for human crew, in the context of uh, deep space travel. So for example, if you're an astronaut going to Mars, it's a, it's a nine month trip, so it's gonna, you probably wanna be able to pick up as early as you can whether or not somebody's developing a, a neurodegenerative, particularly a psychiatric disease, uh, uh, ideally from their, from their overall body language. But we're really not limited to animals with this kind of technology. I mean, as we showed, we, we uh, were inspired by a lot of these, techn these techniques that were developed in humans and we applied it to animals, but why not plants? So we, uh, you know, we made this <laughs> naturally, right? Um, we, you know, we made Sleep open source, we made it easy to use, and as a consequence, not only have we had lots of users, we had lots of very diverse users. So we were actually contacted kind of out of the blue by some, some folks who are, are plant bio, biophysicists who are really interested in looking at plant motion. And without really doing any kind of algorithmic work, but really just kind of exploring the parameter space that sleep already allows you uh, to just to, to configure to work better in your own data, we, we worked with them to adapt it to work well on time-lapse data of all sorts of different plants in a, in a, across a variety of different settings. And so you can see that you're able to pull out the dynamics underlying all sorts of different kinds of plants, plant movements captured in these very long time scale uh, time-lapse data, which here look a little bit more natural. But the principle is the same. And in going back to I mean, questions about, well, what do you do about structures that aren't well constrained by, by a skeleton, this is one, one of these settings in which we have to begin to tackle that problem. So this is also the first time that we attempted to uh, come up with uh, labeling schemes that would allow us to, to track these more curvy structures, though there's still more work to be done there. But once I started my lab at the Salk, it was a very natural extension of this work to apply it uh, to uh, work with the Salk Harnessing Plants Initiative, where this is a multi-lab collaboration of which we were a part of that is attempting to curb climate change by uh, uh, engineering and, and selecting for crop plants that have deeper roots, more roots, and roots that produce more carbon-rich polymers like subarin, which is the core constituent of, of cork. All of these are essentially things that are, that are controlled by different biological processes that all have the, the consequence of pulling more CO2 out of the atmosphere and sequestering it into the soil just by driving additional root growth. And if we focus on doing this in crop species, we have, the natural, uh, uh, we have a natural mechanism for scaling this through the global agricultural system, right? You just ship seeds out that automatically have enhanced carbon sequestration capabilities. And this is an effort I'm particularly excited to contribute to. But while they've had, you know, they have amazing world-class uh, plant biologists and geneticists at the Salk, one of the things that they were missing was uh, a way to do high-throughput phenotyping, which is essential for doing things like genome-wide association studies and other kinds of ways to discover the genetic basis of, of root growth. And so uh, working with Wolfgang Busch's lab at Salk, we've, been, uh, we've developed a system to apply uh, sleep to the problem of phenotyping plant root system architectures, where the idea is to track all the roots, in this case in these cylindrical planters. So here we're not tracking things over time, but rather over just different viewpoints and extracting all sorts of, uh, of traits that describe this, this morphology that then allows us to classify them as whether they have more or less carbon sequestration capabilities. And um, we recently pre-printed uh, this work, which we call, uh, together with a toolkit that we call Sleep Roots, that enables not only root pose estimation using sleep, but also trait extraction using root landmarks. And this is something that folks had not really uh, done before in the, in the plant phenotyping field, believe it or not, which largely relied on image segmentation, which once again, if we hearken back to the old days of animal uh, uh, behavior quantification, it was the similar, similar idea, similar basis, where we used to have to do background subtraction and therefore segmentation to separate our animals from the background and then try to make sense of it, much in the way that C-Tracks did. This is still largely how lots of folks do uh, plant root phenotyping. But the idea here is that if we use sleep, we can bypass this problem of 
doing segmentation entirely and just skip straight to detecting the entire morphology uh, of the root system architecture. And then we developed a whole uh, pipeline to extract traits from all sorts of different plant species. We show that it's just as accurate as, as humans at, at phenotyping plants. And importantly, it's not only uh, faster, but more sample efficient and accurate than segmentation-based approaches. Once again, kind of trying to optimize against all those axes just in a new domain. And the, the kinds of applications of this is, is naturally to do phenotype mapping. Think of this as analogous to what we did with Keypoint MoSeq, which is to say uh, leverage having the ability to uh, be able to do phenotyping at scale to just automatically discover structure from the data itself, thereby allowing us to kind of map out this sort of trait space. Cool. So I'll just finish off with a couple of quick ideas in terms of where we're going next. And one very natural extension of a lot of this work is naturally to do this in three dimensions, right? Um, but of course, there are unique challenges there. Um, however, in collaboration with uh, Annegret Faulkner and our friends at, at Princeton, we've been uh, adapting uh, uh, Anipose uh, software developed by Lily Karashuk and Bing Brunton's lab to do triangulation-based 3D pose tracking. And so the idea here is that we uh, need to essentially figure out which animal corresponds to which across all the different cameras that we have to then be able to triangulate them. And this is something, this is a problem that doesn't exist in the single animal setting. Once again, mirroring the challenges that we had when we moved from single animal to multi-animal 2D pose tracking. But the idea is that once again, once we're able to solve that association problem, and we'll, we'll, we'll be hopefully publishing some of our, our early work on this in the coming months, we're able to then take multiple viewpoints that have sleep tracking and use that to triangulate uh, the body parts of multiple interacting animals, finally getting us to the, uh, one of the most complete representations of body kinematics in the context of social behavior, and once again, removing barriers to, to more clever experimental designs where, given that we can do 3D pose, we can create more naturalistic environments and environments with more uh, variation in terms of the, the 3D structure of the environment. And um, one of the application cases that we've had for this, this kind of approach is to uh, study naturalistic human behavior, where in collaboration with the LA County Museum of Art and Tom Albright at Salk, uh, we received funding from the NSF to uh, characterize how human behavior in a museum exhibit can be used to predict how they engage with different parts of the, the exhibit and, and, and behave in, in their different settings. And so once again, we went there and just basically, you know, we looked at it and it seemed like it was essentially the same problem, right? Just, just got to scale it up. So we printed the, the world's most expensive Taruco board. Um, that was just massive to be able to calibrate a whole bunch of different cameras, a whole camera array that was laid out all around this, this museum exhibit room. Uh, we've, we, we went down and uh, captured images that allow us to reconstruct what the different uh, pieces look like using uh, techniques from computer vision like uh, neural radiance fields or NERFs, and then applied our triangulation-based approach to do essentially what we were doing with the animals, which is to, to reconstruct their 3D poses from having multiple viewpoints. But where this gets really fun is where, you know, now we can, by combining our environment reconstruction with our 3D motion capture, we can essentially retarget the camera and re-render what the viewpoint would have been like for each person in this exhibit as they navigate around the exhibit, therefore giving us the ability to place a, a virtual camera on participants' heads without their, their knowledge. To be clear, they're very much informed that they're being filmed. Uh, there is a QR code at the entrance of the exhibit where they can learn all about the study. Uh, to our knowledge, not very many people have scanned that QR code, but it's, it's there. And for what it's worth, we've been told repeatedly by the IRB that people are already uh, being filmed all the time while they're in a museum for security purposes. So it seems like fair game. OK. And then for our very last piece here, and I won't belabor this point, but 
now that you've learned all about the amazing and wondrous things that you can do with key point tracking, we now have to acknowledge the fact that at the end of the day, the brain does not control key points. This is fundamentally the incorrect representation to characterize behavior if we really want to understand the brain, right? Whether we're, you know, even if we're doing all sorts of unsupervised behavioral quantification on top of the key points, ultimately the brain is not sending signals down the spinal cord to actuate key points. It is actuating the body. And the body is one thing that we've been very blissfully ignoring for decades, for centuries now in neuroscience. But it is, at the end of the day, the, the last and very important missing step if we really want to understand the full loop between environment and, and, and neural processing. And this gets us to the, the most exciting direction of, of my, my research program. This is something that uh, I'm super excited to, to get into once I started my, my independent lab. And we've been uh, get, attempting to get off the ground over the past uh, year and a half or so with a really amazing uh, group of folks um, uh, from everywhere from, from Harvard and Stanford and Salk and Columbia and UW and Stanford and all sorts of other places where the idea is to combine what is certainly going to be very heavily featured all around this conference, this, this, new, this new field of neuro AI of using uh, uh, you know, neural networks to model the brain itself and combining that with what is enabled by this kind of technologies like motion capture, which is to do uh, physics-based simulation of animal bodies, right? And so the idea here is that, you know, while neuro AI kind of finally brings to uh, the forefront the, the promise of classical works from folks like Fukushima, who originally were inspired by network, of, uh, by brain architectures and went the way they were developing the mathematics and underlying neural networks, or artificial neural networks, to now, you know, uh, seeing how the work from, you know, folks like Dan Yamins and Jim DiCarlo uh, that have demonstrated that deep neural networks are actually quite good models of the brain. Uh, we're now kind of combining that with what these technologies for measuring behavior give us, which is the ability to uh, uh, retarget biomechanically realistic bodies constrained by real behavior. In other words, we're going to do the same thing that people do in Hollywood with the motion capture suits. We're going to recreate uh, real movements, not of actors, but rather of animals. And then we're going to try to simulate how can we get a virtual brain to produce virtual behavior that looks as much as possible like real behavior. And we call this framework the virtual neuro lab. And the idea is to essentially create a repertoire of a whole bunch of different virtual animals with different virtual brains that are constrained by real data and that subsequently uh, allow you to do virtual experimentation, virtual neuroscience. Activate neurons in the context of behavior, record from neurons in the context of behavior, modify aspects of the environment and see how that changes neural activity and so forth. And importantly, by making this possible using deep learning, where we're able to do is to always be able to error correct. If, we, if ever our models make wrong predictions, there's nothing fundamental about it that precludes us from being able to refine the model with new experimental data. So we'll record in, in one part of the brain uh, where we made predictions about what kind of neural activity was happening there. And then if we were wrong, we can now fine tune the network to ensure that that part of the brain now produces the correct neural activity under the same behavioral conditions as the real animal did and then move on to the next part of the brain until naturally we solve the whole brain, right? It should, should be easy. And um, if, you're, if you're curious about this, some of our uh, preliminary work is gonna be on display uh, here at the conference, um, poster 3-109 on Saturday by Eric Leonardis, in which we've been kind of characterizing some of the, the parameters of the system, namely in trying to understand how the, the properties of the underlying biomechanical models affect the, the neural representations and, and uh, behavior of our virtual animals. In other words, just how some of the, the early work in neuro AI has been characterizing what are the elements that are essential for training uh, artificial neural networks that look like real brain, that can predict the activities of real brains. We're doing the same thing now with what properties of bodies and biomechanics are necessary to get us to 
like once again, learn representations that are realistic that real brains are, are, are controlling. And our strong hypothesis is, going back to the whole motivation from our first slide, is that given the fact that brains evolved expressly because of the need to move, that if we're now modeling the brain with a realistic output space, the output space that brains evolved to control, muscles and bodies, that we're now gonna be imposing a much stronger inductive bias to ensure that the representations that we learn are more likely to be realistic and more likely to advance our understanding of the brain by, uh, uh, by being more faithful to the, the mechanisms that gave rise to it. Okay, that's the end. Uh, we're right up at our, at our break time here. So I just wanna say thanks to everyone. Thank you for listening. Especially wanna thank the folks in my lab, the, the, especially Liesl Marie, our software engineer uh, extraordinaire and head engineer of sleep. She's put a lot of hours over the past couple of weeks in making the tutorial possible. So we're really excited to share that with you guys. Uh, all of our amazing funding sources for uh, uh, <laughs> somehow being convinced that all this crazy animal simulation stuff is gonna make any kind of sense. And all the other amazing folks in our lab and collaborators. And once again, thank you guys for, for listening. So um, that was fun. Uh, we are going to transition to our tutorial part of the session now. So we have uh, another 10, 15 minutes of break. And when we come back, we're going to get started with our tutorial. So around 2.15, 2.20, I'll just introduce how the general tutorial is going to flow. But for the most part, it's going to be pretty self-guided. Uh, and we'll be walking around to help people. But feel free to, to catch me if you have any questions. Thanks, guys. <laughs>